Hello Internet, and welcome to Freeblades 101, the turn sequence. What I hope this is, is the first in a series of videos I do that goes on to explains and highlights Freeblades. Uh, Freeblades is a 32mm fantasy skirmish game done by a company called DGS Games. <coughs> so, uh, fantasy skirmish means that it is not ray guns and laser swords and flying ships so if that's your thing this is not the video or the game for you but if you're open to f playing a more sword shield magic uh, battle axe warhammer sort of a game hack and slash um, you know, shooting with bows and crossbows then stick around uh, hopefully you guys will enjoy it being that this is a skirmish game all the models will move individually. Uh, you're not going to need to have a huge selection. Um, you're going to start out with six or seven to start with, and you're capped at less than 20. You 32 millimeter means that the normal height of a normal uh, male human would be 32 millimeters tall. Uh, it scales well with things like Warhammer, uh, Kings of War, Frostgrave, those sort of, of types of games. Um, Going into what we have here, we have two factions. Um, obviously, if you've played Free Blades, you know how to play. This is going to be probably a very boring video for you, unless you're just here for the comedic relief that is me. Um, we've got the Kazarks down here, and the Herodellans up here. Uh, we have them at four guys apiece, roughly the same size point-wise. The Kazarks have a slight advantage at 73 points. The Herodellans are at 70 points. Uh, the Herodellans are known as the questing knights on foot, crusaders. They've got peasants with them. They've got the holy warriors that are like the cleric, war priest type caster. Um, knights, heavily armored, more on the slower end. The Kazarks are the mountain folk, uh, also called the nut dwarves. They love stone, metal, gems, that sort of thing. You need a board to play on, or a table, or a space. It can be a floor. Uh, it can be this. Normal game would be four foot uh, by four foot square is what you play on. This is truncated down because I just want to show the turn sequences. And I don't want to spend a turn or two positioning around, so I threw them close together. You're going to need some terrain. It goes on to talk about terrain. I, again, I want to do other videos. goes to talk about all the different aspects of this game. For this one, I want to stick close to the turn sequence. So the train, we have this ruined tower here. Uh, there is an archer up there. There are stairs to get up there. So moving up to get to this level did not require any sort of a test. If you wanted to hop down or climb down, he could try either of those, or he could just move his normal movement back over to the stairs and get back down. There is a second level to the tower. If he'd want to get up there, since there are no stairs going up, he would have to take a climb test. And bad things can happen if you fail a climb test. Here we have a pond. A pond is considered deep water. It's a watery feature um, that will matter for certain models moving water better than others. Since it is deep water, you have to take a swim test to move through it. You can't just go running around on it because it's fairly deep. Here we have a woods. It is a surprisingly woods type of feature. Uh, it is considered rough, and so that means you cannot run through it. The pond will not block line of sight. The forest does. You can only see six inches into it, or if you're in it, six inches out of it, even if you're on the edge. So unless you are actually straddling the edge, if you were right here, you can only see six inches. So that means you can't see these guys, and they can't see you. And you cannot move or see through the entire thing. And here I go cheating again by moving the stuff. So if you're here, and you're trying to look over through here, you cannot do it because you cannot see through it, even if it's less than six inches. And then we also have down here, we have some low walls. Low walls will hinder your movement. They're considered rough, so that means you cannot run over them. You just have to maneuver at your base speed. Um, and they are masking, which means if you go to shoot over them, they will help the person's defense. You're harder to hit, unless you're standing up next against it. Then you can kind of hide behind it, but you aren't giving the bonus to anybody else. 
everything in this game is done in inches. Uh, I am tailoring this video to where you kind of have a semblance of you know what a war game, a miniature war game is, tabletop war game. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail. I can do that in a future video maybe. Um, but everything is measured in inches. You can measure it any time. Pre-measuring is allowed. And everything is based off of dice. If somebody's better at something, they're going to use a bigger dice. It's not going to change the number they need to get. It's going to change the die they use to get it. So if you're not so good at combat, like the Cryomancer of the Kazarik, who only has a D6, you're going to get a D6. But the Fist of Vigenar, which is more of the War Priest Cleric of the Herodellans, he has a D8. So he can still be kind of a nice beat stick after he used up, his up all of his power. The leaders, like the High Quester and the Forge Warden, are D12s. Uh, the High Quester, because he has a high ability, uh, a high dexterity, he actually gets a D12 plus 1 when he goes to hit. There is other things I'll probably use are the terminology. Um, your speed is how far you can move in inches. There's maneuver and running. Maneuver is you move your speed in inches. Running is you move up to double your speed in inches. The last three in inches have to be in a straight line and you cannot change your facing after you move. There are facings in this. Rear and front. Bisects the model in half, uh, with the front half being the front and the back half being the back. Line of sight is 360, but a lot of stuff does need front arc in order to shoot, cast a spell, charge, attack, etc., etc. The... The dice will change, um, there will be modifiers to it, uh, through spells, through abilities, things like that. And you also have your melee attack rating, and your ranged attack rating, which are shorts, uh, the acronyms are MAR and RAR, so if you hear me use that, you know RAR is the ranged, and the MAR is the melee. The casters have what is known as a CAR, which is their casting uh, rating. Uh, so that's what they're used to cast their spells. To start with, both casters start with 15 power and have a D10 car, um, which are nice, nice little tokens to help denote their power they have. And in this game, we have an objective. The objective's in the middle. The objective does nothing for terrain. You can move over it, move around it. It does not block line of sight. Sometimes they will, and this objective, it does not. The objective of this little tutorial is to have somebody in base contact with the objective without having an enemy model within three inches of the objective for two consecutive turns. Now if you do it one turn and then somebody moves in, it resets the counter. You have to have it two consecutive turns. So we have the, the first sequence of any turn is called the events phase. This is where certain things within a scenario may happen. Uh, if you're playing a mission where there are demons showing up, demons could get summoned. In this one, again, we just have the one objective. There's nothing special, so we're just going to go ahead and roll initiative. You roll initiative at the start of every turn. It is a D10, so we have these multicolored DGS dice for the Kazariks and the purple dice for the Herodellans. Take the dice, and we just roll them. So we got a 2 for the Kazariks and a 10 for the Herodellans. Now, the Herodellans have spiked. A spike is when you roll the highest die, highest number on a die. So on a d10 you roll a 10, on a d6 you roll a 6, on a d8 you roll an 8, etc. You then pick that die up, you roll it again, and you're adding to it. So they've already rolled a 10. They've now rolled a 3, so that's a 13. The opposing score of the Kazarks was a 2, so they've scored now a crit. If you get 10 more than the target number you need, or more than an opposing roll, like the initiative test, it's called a crit. With a crit, there's always a bonus. You will always get a bonus with a crit of some sort. For initiative, your crit is, or the, the bonus for critting is, you are allowed to put two models on delay instead of attempting only one. If you want to put a model on delay, they have to take a test. If they pass the test, they can hold and not do their movement action until after the second player goes. If you fail your test, though, you don't get to move at all. You just hold for your action. The hair downs don't want to do anything like that. They're going to go ahead, um, and we're going to get into the, the next phase. So that was the first phase. That's the event phase. Over and done. 
So now we go into the magic phase. This is where things start getting different from other war games. If you've played other war games, normally the movement phase would be the next phase. Not in this game. In this game it's magic, which means you cannot do movement before your magic. Which means you have to set up your caster the prior turn and think ahead of where do you want him so he can cast spells for the next turn. So the Herod Dallins, uh, he is going to go ahead and cast the Fist of Midunar, which is their caster. He is going to cast Aaliyah's Light. Or not Aaliyah's Light, I'm sorry. Uh, Tanir's Blessing. Tanir's Blessing, uh, you pick a friendly model within 18 inches. He is going to pick this wonderful Muster Archer up here. It is in his front arc. As you can see, you do this like this. It's in his front arc. And he is well within range and in line of sight. And you cast, you roll, roll with your casting value. His casting value, again, for the casters is D10 to start with. For spells, the target number is 2. Unless it's a summoning spell, then it's 4. The, the fist is wearing armor. That kind of interferes with his casting. So he actually has to subtract 2 from his dice roll. So he has to actually roll a 4 normally to get his spells to go off. Now, he doesn't have any summoning spells, so that's all he really ever has to worry about. But he can use more power to bump it up. So Tanar's Blessing is normally a, a one power. So we're going to take one power, he's going to spend it. But he wants to reduce that so that he doesn't have to roll a four. He only wants to have to roll a two. So he's going to spend two more power. Now I could spend one extra power and just drop it down to a negative one. Or you could spend the two and drop it down by negative two, which is what he's going to do. So he rolls a five. It goes off. You have to be within your caster rating. So since these guys are casters D10s, you have to be within 10 inches of the caster or the target to try and counterspell it. And again, there's pre-measuring in this. Nowhere near 10 inches. So the Kazar caster can't even try and stop it. So it goes off successfully. We're going to use this little thin leaf to denote that he's got a buff. So now that means he's got a plus two die level to his ranged attack rating. So his RAR is going to be plus two die level, not plus two to the die roll. His D6 RAR, which is what it is normally, is going to go up to a D10. Which is, you know, kind of nice to have. That casting is done. Now we go over to these guys' casting, the Kazarics. He's going to cast, it's a spell. Uh, again, he is a Cryomancer, so he deals an ice in energy, as opposed to the spirit magic of the Fist of Vigenar, which is more of blessings, healings, um, buffing your guys. This is going to be filling them with, with holy lights and, and stuff like that. <coughs> this is going to have a more, the Cryomancer is going to have a much more uh, cold uh, aspect to it. So he's going to cast Ice Skin. He's going to cast Ice Skin on the Forge Warden here. The Forge Warden is well within range. He's going to pay the two power for it. So we're going to take two of his power things, stick them over here. A seven. So it goes off. Again, the caster cannot stop it. He's not close enough. We're going to put this big broad leaf on him, showing he's got a plus one to his armor value. So it'll be harder to damage in combat. Spells only ever last for one turn. At the end of the turn, they go away. Because these guys are using different kinds of magic, spirit and energy, the gods do not like that. They've split the magic. They don't want the magic anywhere near to each other. And because they're using both, the gods get angry. When nine power of each type has been used, something nasty usually happens on the battlefield. It's a really cool chart. If we get there, we'll roll on it. I'll show it to you guys. It is fairly cool, but it is nasty. So... That now, magic phase is done. We're done with two of the phases. Two down, four more to go. We now have the movement phase. This would be where if the Herodellans wanted to, they could because they crit their initiative, attempt to put two guys on delay. Um, they don't want to do that because they don't want to waste the movement. So, you can maneuver or you can run or you can charge. Even if you're not in range to charge, you can still declare the charge and get bonuses from it. Uh, the hype Quester does not want to do that. Um, the High Quester has a rule that he gives March. 
the special rule march to all of his guys. Which means if they maneuver, they get an extra die, or an extra inch in their movement. So, he can move six, and he's going to maneuver up six inches. Now, what maneuvering does is he's done there. If somebody were to come in from behind him and, and get into contact with him, he'd be able to turn to face them in the combat section. If he would have ran, the last three inches had to be in a straight line or be in the same direction, and he would never be able to turn his facing. If you charge, the charge is up to double your movement, and it's in a straight line directly to who you're going towards. But again, you cannot turn. Uh, you cannot turn to face, so if somebody gets around behind you, you're not going to be able to attack them back, and you lose your shield bonus like he has to his defense. Uh, bonuses for charging on why you'd want to charge is you go first in the combat. Unless somebody has a standoff weapon like a spear, if you charge, you're going first. You get a plus one uh, to the die roll to damage. So if your damage is normally a D8, it would be a D8 plus one. And the, second, or the last thing is, is you cannot get piled on. If you get attacked by multiple enemy models, your defense goes down. You're easier to hit as more guys start attacking you. If you are considered charging, you've got too much momentum that that doesn't affect you on the turn you charge. So, we're going to have the spear guy. He can move six normally, so he can move up to seven and still maneuver. And he's going to get right behind his buddy. Because he has a standoff attack uh, the, with a spear, he can attack through the, his buddy that he's in contact with through the front arc. So if that Forge Warden comes up to him, they're both going to be able to strike. And then the Fist, he's going to kind of play it cool. And he can only maneuver. Because he casted a spell, he cannot run. He could still charge to get into combat, but he cannot run. Because he took an action. And the Archer is not going to move, because if you move and shoot, you don't shoot as well. So he wants to take full effect of that plus two die level to shooting. End of the Herodalon's movement phase. If you've noticed, one player will do all of their phase, then the next player will do all of their phase. It's not a, the Herodalons do all of their turn, and then the Kuzarks do all of their turns. It's, each phase is broken up. So, to start, the Forge Warden is going to move up to here. And pretty much say, come at me, bro. It's his bonus. The Explorer has a Wayfinder ability, which means normally you cannot run through rough terrain. But he can run through terrain that's considered mountainous and wood features because of his Wayfinder ability. He's used to doing that. So his movement is 5, so he can go up to 10. But the last three inches have to be in a straight line, and he cannot change his facing afterwards. So he's going to get up to here like this, and stop, still facing the same way. And he is over six inches away from the fist, and over six inches away from the archer. So neither of them can even see him to shoot him, or to charge him next turn. The quarreler is going to stay put. Again, moving and shooting is not good. The, the double crossbow that he has actually has a reload rule to where he cannot move over half of his movement uh, if he still wants to shoot. And then we're going to move up the caster to be hiding behind the wall here. So, the Kazark movement phase is done. We now go on to the shooting phase. The shooting phase is considered simultaneous, so if the archer were to shoot the quarreler and kill him, the quarreler would still get his shot, but then he would be dead afterwards. So, the archer <clears throat> is not within six inches of the leader. The leader has an ability called shoot them. You normally have to shoot the closest non-concealed target. <coughs> if you want to shoot something farther away, you have to pass a discipline check. Now, the discipline check is different for each model. Um, there are followers and heroes are the two basic types of models. Followers will have a D4 or a D6 usually for their abilities and checks and whatnot, whereas heroes will usually have a D8 or a D10. Leaders have a D12. If you're within six inches of the leader, you get to use his discipline. And if you're within six inches of the leader, he has the shoot them ability where he just tells you, no, shoot that guy. I don't care if he, there's another guy closer. So normally the archer would have to shoot this Forge Warden. Well, he's already got a buff on him. 
and that bow's not going to do all that much damage. But if I can put wounds on that, that uh, Cryomancer there, he doesn't have a lot of armor. So he's going to attempt to try and do a, a shooting test to hit the farther away Cryomancer. Now, he only gets to roll a d4. If he does roll a 1 and touches it, he's not going to be able to shoot at all. If he rolls a 2 or a 3, which is still a fail, he'll be able to still target the closest model. But if he touches it, he doesn't get to shoot at all. He's going to forego a shooting. So we'll see if we're lucky or not. A 4. Okay, so now again, he spikes. Not only is it a success, but he gets to roll it again. 8. Ooh. 9. So it's not 10 more than his target number. Target number was 4. So he does not get a crit. Why would I keep rolling for a crit? He Either he passes or he doesn't. Well, in Free Blades, they're like, well, no, no, you should be rewarded. So if you crit and there is no extra bonus that you get from it, you get something that's called a Fate Stone. A Fate Stone is a reroll for that model. That model then can reroll any die that is pertaining to him, any attack. Uh, if he's got uh, an ability roll he has to take. If he'd want to jump down and he failed that, he could reroll that. Um, if he would have gotten two crits off of it, two um, degrees of crits, it would have gotten him what's called a Destiny Stone. The Destiny Stone is for the entire free band. Anybody in the free band can use it. Again, he passes it. He didn't crit it, so he can pick whoever he wants. He's going to pick the Cryomancer. He's going to be the easiest target. He cannot see the Explorer. The Explorer would probably have been an easier kill, but that's okay. We're going to attempt to shoot the Cryomancer. The Cryomancer, again with the pre-measuring, whenever you want, is over 12 but less than 13. The range band on the bows is 8, uh, 16, 24. So if it was within 8 inches, there's no minus to the range. If he's within 16 inches, which he's in, he's in medium range, that's minus 1. If he's within 24 inches for the bow, that would be minus 2. Over 24 inches, out of range, can't shoot it. Each ranged weapon has its own different kind of bands. Uh, the double crossbow has the same band as the bow. So for what we see here, everything's going to be 8, 16, or 24. So he is over 12, less than 13. That's within that medium band, so he's got a negative 1 to his die roll. Cryomancer, hiding behind that wall, gets a plus one to his defense. His defense is normally a four, so that goes up to a five. And the Muster Thresher is normally a D6 RAR, but because he's got that bonus, that pops up from the D6 to the D8, the D8 to the D10. So he's got a lot better chance of having this hit, needing a five minus one. So he has to roll a six on the die, which is a lot better than having to roll a six on a D6. A seven. So he hits. So, 7 minus 1, 6, so it's a hit. We now go for the damage. The damage on the bow is a d6. The armor value, which is what now the weapon damage needs to meet or beat, for the crown answer is only a 2. So as long as he rolls a 2 or more, he's going to do a wound to the crown answer. So he rolls a 6. Uh-oh. So he spikes. Ooh, just a 1, so a 7. So it's enough to do a life point wound. Now the Kazarks, their special kind of ability that they all have is called Die Hard. Whenever they're going to suffer a life point of, of damage, they can take a Endurance Test, which is one of the attributes for the models. If they pass this Endurance Test, they reduce the life point damage they take by one. All the models have at least Die Hard 1, which means they can try it on one wound they suffer each turn. So since the caster is considered a hero, his ability is a D8. There is no other bonuses. He doesn't have a higher endurance. Um, things like the Forge Warden has a higher strength. Um, the Like I said, the High Quester has a higher dexterity. Uh, the caster has nothing extra high. So he just uses the regular D8, and he's looking at the target number for this is a 7, though. So he's got a chance. He rolls a 7 exactly. Just talk to Darren about that. You guys will... You guys will see, I'm, I'm notorious for those. So he doesn't suffer any life points. So the, the arrow hits him, but he's tough skinned. He's this Tazaric rough warrior. That's the, they live in the mountains. They're gruff. He just kind of pulls the arrow out and says, well, whatever. So that's the Mustard Archer's shooting phase. So now the Quarreler. He would normally have to target the High Quester, but he doesn't want you. We're going to shoot this Spearman. He's probably going to be a little easier to hit. Um... And, and if we can get rid of him, we'll hopefully even up the, the combat that's coming. Uh, we are well within the six inches. 
of our leader, so we don't have to worry about any types of tests. You don't need to be in front arc for shoot them to work. You just have to be within the six inches. So he's going to go ahead and take his D6. Is his RAR as well. He is eight inches away. And that's what the band is, is eight inches. So he's within the eight inches, so he's good. He has no minuses there. Um, he is partially concealed by his buddy, though. So he's going to have a plus one defense, so his defense goes up to a six. So I need to roll a six on the die. But I do get two shots because it's a double crossbow. He did not move, so the weapon special rule is if the model does not move, he gets to shoot twice at one target. So the first attempt is a three. The second attempt is a five. So almost, but not quite. That is the shooting phase. Shooting phase is now done. We now go into the fight phase. There are no fights. Nobody's in contact with each other. So we go to the end phase. End phase is when the spells end. So the bonuses come off. We would check victory conditions. The Herodellans are now in contact with the objective, but it does not count because the Forge Warden is within two inches. He has to be within three. He's well within three. We go now to the top of turn two. So the events phase. Again, the only thing we have to worry about for the events phase in this is rolling initiative. So a one to a two. So the Kazarks win this one. <coughs> Excuse me. So they go with their magic phase. Well, this caster is going to try and blast this archer. So what that means is he's going to try and use one of his magic missile spells. The Kazarks, again, doing their ice damage, have a, it's called, it's called Frostbite. Pretty much it's the target model is suffered to a ranged attack. And then the damage is going to be based on the armor value. The less armor you have, the easier it is to hit you. Well, since he's low armor value, he'll be very easy for me to wound if I can get to him. Or if I can hit him. So the first thing I do is I have to pay the power for it. Which Frostbite is a two power. So we'll use up two more power. Target number is two. I rolled a four. So that's successful. Now... He is well within his range to try and counterspell this. But because it's spirit magic trying to stop energy magic, he would have to spend one extra to do it. And he still has that negative two he has to worry about unless he adds extra damage, extra power into it. So at base, he has to spend three just to make the attempt. And then he's going to be at a negative two, which means he has to roll a six. I'm okay if the mustard thresher dies. The thresher archer. The mustard archer. Muster Archer dies. So we're not going to try and counterspell with that. He wants to save his power to make his guy bigger, badder, meaner, and, and whatnot. So it goes off successfully. Now he has to make a ranged attack using his car rating, his caster rating, as his attack roll. So it's a D10, because that's what it is. It's a missile weapon, so it's range 18, with the band of 9. So he's over 9, so he's going to have a negative 1. Um, and he's got a plus one defense because he's concealed. So the defense of the archer is normally four, goes up to five. So that means I have to roll a six on the die. He might be able to do it. A three, I do not do it. So he successfully casted the spell, but didn't even hit. Another reason why you kind of have to play that game of do I want to counterspell it or not. Now it is the fist's turn. The Fist doesn't like having stuff being cast at his friend, so he is going to go ahead and cast Aaliyah's Light. And what that is, is he's going to cast that on the High Quester, and that means all melee attacks against his High Quester are going to be negative two to their die level to hit him. Which means it's not going to be very easy to hit him. So let's see, that takes three. And he is going to use the extra two, so he'll use all five to make sure he goes off on a two. Goes off on a six. Now, that is within nine inches of this caster. He is going to try and stop that because we don't want him to be... 
He doesn't want his leader to be at negative two dice level to try and stop that. Now, the Cryomancer only has to use the base cost of the spell, which is three, to try and stop it. So that's what he's going to do. So he's going to get back seven from his ten chip counter. And now he's going to roll a die. Use the right die here. He rolled a six. I have to roll higher than a six. If I roll a six, it still goes off because I am more or less creating the new target number for the caster. I'm now turning this into an opposed roll. A seven. So it does not go off. He does not equal or beat the new number. I countered the spell. And we'll use one more power because it's a opposite type. So I have to use four and not three. Okay, that's the magic phase. We now go to the movement phase. The Kazarks have the turn. They're going to attempt to put their leader on delay. So what this is, is he has to take a discipline check. If he fails this check, target number is four. Everything's target number is four unless it states otherwise. If he fails this check, he has to hold. He'll still be able to counter or sit there, and he is still contesting the objective. So I'm okay with waiting to see what goes on here. So... Roll to die. A 10. He successfully passes it. So now he is on delay. If they don't come and get him, he will be able to act after. Uh, let's see. We are going to have the explorer. Mm -hmm. um, again, you cannot, uh, movement restrictions, I probably should go over this, you cannot get within one inch of enemy models unless you end in contact with an enemy model. So, if these guys were an inch apart, and I wanted to go in between them to charge this guy behind him, I could do that and come within one inch of those guys, but I have to end within contact with an enemy. We're going to kind of have this guy just skedaddle and move uh, over this way. And he's just hanging out. He's now in the rear arc of the fist, so the fist can't even see him still. He can see him. He cannot uh, charge him. He could maneuver to get to him. Um, the coral is going to stay put because he wants to be able to shoot well. And the cryomancer is going to stay put because... Um, wants to hide behind this wall and try and stop the archer from shooting him. So that is the movement phase for the Kazards, save for their guy that is on delay. So, the High Quester, well, he's had enough of this. He's going to go get him this Forge Warden. So he's going to say, I am I am attacking. I'm going to, he's going to declare charge. Well, he is over the three inches. So the Forge Warden has an option. He can countercharge him, meaning they'll each move um, and pretty much meet in the middle. They both have the same movement, so they'll meet in the middle. But then that could open him up for the spearman to come around and get him. The Forge Warden has a, a rule that if he does not move other than to change facing, he cannot be piled on. So, knowing that, he's thinking. Do I let him get the charge bonus? I don't think I want to let that guy get the charge bonus. So he's going to declare the counter charge. So the delay comes off. His reaction, because he is on hold or delay, if you have not acted, your models are considered on hold, as long as you're not stunned, knocked down, all that fun stuff. So starting with the active model, he moves one inch. And then the Forge Warden moves one inch. He moves one inch, moving two, and just over two. So neither moved three, so neither count as charging for the purposes of getting bonuses. The Spearman, since he knows this guy moved, and now we can kind of bring him down, he is going to use his seven-inch movement and get behind him. So he's going to just get behind. So he's behind his... His 50% there, the front half. So now he's going to lose his shield bonus to the to the spearman's attack. And the fist. 
He is going to... Again, he can only move because he cast a spell. Move four and a half inches this way, and then he's going to turn to keep everybody in his front arc now. So he can cast a spell on anybody he wants to, and he can go and help if he needs to. Alright. So now we go to the shooting step. Shooting step. We are still within six inches of the leader, so we can shoot whoever we want. Um, you know what? We're going to go ahead and we're going to double tap into the uh, Fist of Vijunar anyways, even though because he is the closest and he is in the open, um, because that's, that's an easier shot for us. Uh, we are just over seven inches away, so we'll go ahead and do this shot there. It's not concealed, not over half range, so it's just his regular D6. The Fist's defense is four, so he's got to roll a four on a D6. He rolls a six, so he rolls again. A seven. If your hit roll spikes, then your damage roll, or if your, I'm sorry, if your hit roll crits, your damage roll is already considered to be, you've already spiked it. So if he would have gotten 10 more than the four, if he would have gotten a 14, he would have already been considered as rolling a six for his damage. Now this caster is fairly heavily armored. He's got a six armor. Luckily, the, the crossbow does d6 plus one, so I only need to roll a five on the dice, and I'll do a wound to him. So, a one. He does not wound. But he gets his second shot because he did not move. Again, needing a four to hit him. I roll a three. He misses. So we hit him with one, but the armor stops it, and we miss him with the second shot. This thresher uh, is going to... He cannot see the explorer... And I'm going to say that they are both roughly the same distance, so he's not going to need to take a test. So he can shoot the Cryomancer. Now he's only a D6, though. And he's at medium range. And he's hiding behind a wall. So his defense is 5, minus 1, he has to roll a 6 to hit him. He rolls a 3, he misses. All right, shooting is done. Now we'll go into the fight phase. So, nobody's kind of discharging. The model with the standoff attack moved, so it does not get to strike first. So we go in discipline order. The discipline of the High Quester and the Forge Warden are the same, so we'll let the High Quester go first. Uh, the attacks do happen simultaneously. Um, high Quester is a D12 plus one, and his, guys, and his defense now is down to a four. Because there's a model piled onto him, he's not immune to that because he moved. A 10 will hit. He has a D8 for his damage. The armor value of the Forge Warden is 6 because he's heavily armored. Ooh, 8. 16. Uh-oh. 17. 17 is 11 more, so it's a crit, so it's two wounds that he's going to suffer. But... He, too, has the Die Hard 1, so he might be able to negate one of these. So I'll mark the two wounds. His Endurance is a D8, because he is still considered a hero, even though he's a leader. Um, but he does get a plus 1, because he is a leader. A leader gets a plus 1 to all ability checks. So when he rolls this, he only needs to roll a 6. So on a 6, 7, or 8, he'll, he will be okay. He will lose, he will stop one of the wounds. So he stops one of the wounds with his diehard. Again, ask Darren. He's up. Now, people would certainly say, hey, you should attack the Spearman. Well, he can't because the Spearman is in his rear arc to begin with. And two, because all heroes, unless you're a bandit or a demon, have something called Hero's Honor. Hero's Honor means if you are in contact with a hero and a follower, you have to attack the hero. Your honor demands that you attack the more worthy opponent. Unless you're a bandit or a demon, because they don't care about stuff like that. So he has a D12. The defense on the High Quester is 5, S, denoting he has a shield. And he is in the front, so he gets his shield. So he needs to roll a 5 or more to hit him. He rolls a 4. He misses. Now, the High Quester... Uh, should have done this at the start. Uh, is it... 
he has an option ability with his shield bash. He could have attempted to shield bash and not use the shield for his defense. He didn't want to do that. He wanted to keep his shield for his defense, so he retains the shield bonus. Um, the second attack is minus two die level to his Mar, so it would have been down to a D8 plus one to hit. Um, he didn't want to do that anyways, so he, that's why he didn't do it. Um, but he can parry this. So it, what happens with a parry is normally you can replace your defense with the Mar after being attacked in melee. He can do this two times per turn because he has parry two, but if you crit the parry, you can repost and get a free attack. Now, if he scores a one, that's gonna that the Forge Warden will hit him now instead of missing him. If he rolls a two or a three, he still is missed. That doesn't reduce your defense lower than what it starts with, unless you roll a one. So he's gonna go ahead and try it because if he can crit it and get another shot into him, why not? Eleven, twelve is not because he still gets his plus one. It's not ten more, so he doesn't get two. He parries it, the the blow, but not enough to get the repost. So now we go on to the Spearman. He gets to do his attack. Now, the Forge Warden is base four because he doesn't get his shield bonus, and now he's down to a three because of the pylon ability. So a six, Ooh. 12, 15, so that's a crit. So that means he's already done eight on his damage, which means it's already enough to surpass his armor, so he's already taken one wound. He might take more. Nope, he's going to take one wound. He's already used his Die Hard ability this turn, so he cannot use it again. And he is now half dead. Uh, he has four wounds, the High Quester has three, and followers always only ever have one to start with. So that combat is over. The Kazarik side, the Forge Warden lost it because the Herodellans have done more wounds in that uh, combat phase, so he has to take a Discipline check. Discipline check, you, you roll your Discipline, target number is four. If you fail, you, you panic. Uh, right, you, yes, not good. So, he gets to roll. A seven, he's fine, he's not going to run away. This turn. End phase, we check the victory conditions. The Forge Warden is still within three inches, so nobody's claimed the first thing on the objective yet. So now, we move on to the events phase. There's nothing special to do. We go straight to initiative. Three for the Herodellans, a six for the Kazariks. So the Kazariks will have the initiative. So again, always starting with magic. My Cryomancer is going to attempt to up his armor. You saw what happened. We need to get that guy some more armor. So we're going to do that uh, ice skin again, which is a plus one uh, damage. So, or plus one armor value, I mean. So, target is well within range. It's a, we rolled a 10. Oh, we rolled an 11. If you would crit a spell, so if you would have gotten a 12, it reduces the amount of power it takes by one. So he still has to pay the full two for it, which is fine, he can do that. But now we're starting to creep up on using that. He's used 10 power because uh, he has five left. So when this guy uses up one more power, he will have used up nine, and the special nasty thing happens in the end phase, which is probably going to happen at the end of this phase. So I'm actually looking forward to that. Um, again, it's successfully cast. He's going to have broad leaf to show he has extra, extra stuff. Okay, so, next up, the Fist. The Fist is going to do his negative two die level to um, the, the, or actually, he's going to do ten years Blessing, because that's going to be a little cheaper to cast. He is going to use three. It takes one base, and he's going to use the extra two, because he wants to only have to cast it on a two. So he only needs a, oops, the other die. he needs a two to cast it because he paid the extra and he rolled a one, of course. So it does not even go off, but the big bad nasty thing does happen because now we've used up 
enough for it starts with a G I can't ever pronounce it so I'm not gonna try the Gal Bohor Gal Gal Bohor Gal Bohor we'll go with that and what this is is you have to roll a D30 now DGS games their dice pack comes with all these kind of weird ones um, again, if you're just starting out, if you're just, this is your first game, you don't have to use this rule. It's fine. It's just kind of cool. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a D24. We need the D24, which again, that die is in the DGS dice pack. So we roll this. A four happens. So we control the chart. Casters must die. Each caster passes an endurance test or loses one life point each time they cast or counterspell. This lasts... This test and any effects occur before the cast or counter spell attempt. Okay, so from now on, if you're going to try and cast, you could try and kill yourself. So, the Fist of Vigenar might just become a beat stick now, which he can do fairly well. Alright, <clears throat> so that's the magic phase, and now we go to the movement phase. So, what we have, he is going to declare a charge on the High Quester. He's within range. The High Quester cannot do anything to stop him because he's engaged. The Fist of Vigunar could try and intercept him once he gets within three inches, but he's not going to worry about that. He's going to let the High Quester deal with him. So he counts as charging. The... Um, the caster and the, excuse me, quarreler are going to stay put. Um, yeah, yeah, stay put. Not going to move. So then their movement's done. Movement phase on the other side. The fist. Now, the fist has an option here. He can maneuver to get into contact with the forge warden. But now because he's not moved, the pylon bonus doesn't count for him. So it doesn't really matter. What he wants to do is make sure that the leader can get free. Um, and that means we need to kill this explorer, which should happen fairly easily. That's a follower. That's a leader. That's a hero. It's not going to go well. So, you know, we're going to actually just have him maneuver into contact with the Forge Warden. Even though he's not going to get the pylon bonus, it's the extra attack on him, and it saves the Spearman. The Spearman now cannot be targeted, because he'll have to target the, the caster. And the caster, again, is still a beat stick. Movement phase is done. Again, flying right through it. Going right to the shooting phase. The crossbowman's going to go ahead and try and double tap up here at the Muster Thresher. Muster Archer. I don't know why I keep saying Thresher. Thresher's their other guy. Uh, the Archer um, is base defense 4. He's concealed, so it goes to 5. And we already know they're less than 13 inches, so we're in that medium band. So he needs to roll a 6 on the die. But he's going to get 2 shots at it. So, first shot, misses. Second shot, misses. He gets to do a shot back. Again, he's going to go at the Cryomancer. Misses, because he needs to roll that 6. Hmm. <coughs> So now we go on to fighting. Now, we have this big, huge mess here. Uh, Freeblades doesn't like to have big messes like this. So the rule set states that you can never have more than two models from one side in any single combat. The person whose turn it is gets to break off people if there is a, uh, a choice on which way they go. But you have to try and keep everybody that is engaged still engaged. So pretty much just by the shortest amount needed, just so that you know they're no longer engaged, the high quester, and he can turn because he did not move or char he did not run or charge this turn. Turns to face the charging explorer, and the warden can turn and face those guys. All right, so now we're ready to do combat. The Kazarks get to pick their combat first. Um, he's going to go ahead. The Kazarks are going to pick to having this because if by some miracle the explorer can kill the high quester, which could happen. 
um, they would then lose all the benefit of his leadership before that combat happens. All right, so Explorer gets to go first, even though he's not the better fighter, because he charged. So he has a D6 on his Mar. The High Quester has a 5 on his defense. He is not using the option talent of Shield Bashing, because he's going to keep that 5 to force the uh, Explorer to roll a six or a 5 or a 6 to hit him. So he rolls a 5. It's a hit. The High Quester is okay with that because he's got parry. So he gets to roll his d12. And he gets to add 1 to it. So he's only got to roll a 5 on a d12. He rolled a 4. He didn't parry. That means the Explorer actually hit him with his Ice Axe. So the Ice Axe does d6 damage. The armor value on the High Quester, though, is quite high. He's got a 6 as well. So, the Explorer has to spike his damage roll in order to hurt the High Quester. Maybe. We'll see if it happens. A 4. But you didn't get to see it. But there it is. So it does not damage. He hit him. He thought maybe for a second he might do it. And then it didn't happen. So now the High Quester gets to go. Oh, and actually that would be a, a 5. Because he gets to add 1 to his damage roll. Because he charged. Still not enough. The High Quester gets to do his attack back. The defense on the Explorer is only a 4, so the High Quester is looking for a 3 on the dice. An 11. So the 11 plus 1 is 12. He hits. It is not a crit, though, so it's just his D8. The armor on the Explorer, because, you know, he's just an Explorer. He's only got 2 armor. A 4. That will do 1 life point of damage to him. But, like I said... That will kill the follower, but he has die hard. So if he can spike this D6 endurance roll, because all followers have a D6 for their ability checks. If he can spike this D6, he won't die. And he'll hold the high quester there for another turn. He rolls a four. He is dead. Now, before I remove him, I'm going to check. I know, but just to show. He is not within six inches of the quarreler. The heroes do not care that he dies, because heroes only care if heroes die, um, and the, the the hero is engaged anyways. So if you're engaged, you don't have to worry about it, but otherwise they have to take a morale check. Otherwise they could panic, because their buddy just died. The quarreler wasn't close enough to really see it, he just, you know, saw the flurry of the High Quester's sword, and, and now his friend's not there anymore. Uh, the other way to win in... in uh, a game of free blades is to break your opponent's warband. To break them, you have to drop them below half of their starting life points value have to be off the table. So even though the Forge Warden has lost two of his life points, he's still on the table, so those four life points still count as being on the table. Now that the Explorer is down who has one, and the Quarreler has one, and the Caster has two, if the Forge Warden dies, they break. With the Herodellans, with one, one, two, and three, again, he's got to kill the leader and somebody else before they even think about breaking. Or everybody but the leader has to die. So now we're going to go to this combat. Nobody's charging, so we go off of discipline. Uh, the discipline of the Forge Warden is 12. The discipline of the Fist is D8, and the Spearman is D6. So the Forge Warden gets to go first. His attacks have to go on to the, the, uh, the Fist. So he takes his d12. The fist's defense is a 4. He rolled a 2. It does not hit. The fist has a mar rating of d8, so he's still a pretty nice beat stick. An 8, so he spikes. And a 6 is 14. His defense is still 5 because he did not move and he has the fortress ability. <clears throat> so it's not a crit, but it is a hit. And the Fist has a War Maddock, which is a D10 damage. And he only needs to roll... Well, he's got to roll a 7, I guess. His armor is 7, so... But he rolled a 9, so he can do it. So that's a life point. But he gets his 1 Endurance test. Again, he gets a D8 plus 1. He's looking to roll a 6 on the die, because he needs to get that 7. It is a 6 on the die, so he does not take that life point of damage. 
Next up is the Spearman. He's got a d6. He needs to roll a 5. He rolls a 4. He misses. That's considered a draw. No way to do any damage. We just sit there, and we're going to go another turn. So, that's the end of that turn. End effects. Nothing's going on. We remove the spell. It is now time to start the next phase. We roll initiative. Herodellans win this turn. Now, when you are engaged in combat, if you decide to cast a spell, which you can do, you allow yourself to get hit by a reaction attack. That caster, one, would have to take an endurance test or lose a life point, so he doesn't want to do that. So he's not going to cast. He'll just, you know what, he's cool. He'll sit there. He'll not let anything happen. The cryomancer, though, knows his buddy's kind of in trouble. He's hurting. So he's got to do something to help him out. So he's going to try and give him that armor again. Mainly because that's the best thing he can do right now to try and help his buddy out, is give him the armor. May give him that 7 armor value. So before he takes the test, he has to take an endurance test. If he fails this endurance test, he loses one life point. So he gets his D8. The endurance test is still just the regular endurance test, so the target number will be 4, because it doesn't say anything else. He rolls a 5. So he, does, he passes that. He can now attempt to cast the spell. He has five power left, so he'll go ahead and use two to cast his ice skin. So that will leave him three left. Oh no! Alright, he successfully casts it. Again, the fist doesn't want to try and counter because he doesn't want to give the Forge Warden a free hit on him, and he doesn't want to take that endurance test. Alright, so now we go to the movement phase. Well, the High Quester is just going to maneuver on in here, just like so. Archer's still going to step there because he thinks he might maybe be able to plink away and, and maybe maybe get one. All right. So, time to sacrifice another follower. The Quarreler is going to... He's going to move out and attempt to get this high quester. If I do then, yeah, we're going to move out. He's going to move six inches and engage the high quester. Which I'm just going to go ahead and split them off right now because I know that's how it's going to go. And the cryomancer is just going to kind of sit there behind the, the wall. Cannot make it to the forest. Okay, so yep, he'll stay hiding behind the wall. So we go to the shooting phase. Now, my quarreler got into combat. He's not going to be able to shoot now. The Herodellans have the initiative anyway, so his shot first. Again, he still needs a six to try and hit this Cryomancer. He rolls a five, so he misses. Muster archers are not the best on their own. And to start with. Uh, we go straight to the fighting phase. The Herodellan wants to go ahead and have this Forge Warden battle start first. Because one, if they can kill the Forge Warden, it'll be game over. And two, if they kill the Forge Warden, the leadership bubble's gone. So you always try and kill the leadership bubble first. If the Forge Warden wins, his leadership bubble is still there if for some reason the Quarreler can try and kill him. Again, nobody is charging in this combat. Um... And so the Forge Warden will go first. He has to attack the Fist. He gets his D12. He rolls a 1, so he fails. Again. The Fist is up. He has his D8. Rolls a 5. That's exactly what he needs to hit him, because his defense is 5S with the shield. Has a D10 damage. His armor is up to 7. So a 4 will not do it. And then the Spearman misses. So that's a draw. They just sit there. Sorry about that, Star Wars buff. 
Uh, we go over here. The high quester gets to go first because he has the highest or highest discipline. D12 plus 1. 12, that will be a hit. The armor value on the quarreler, though, he's pretty well armored. He's got an armor value of 5. So, I mean, it's nothing to sneeze at. A 3 will not hurt him. So it clanks off his armor. So that means now the quarreler gets to strike back. Now the quarreler, though, is not good in combat at all. He rolls a d4. He was purely there just to pull him off the Forge Warden. A 2 misses. He's going to go ahead and parry that because I'm confident he won't roll a 1. And he'll might be able to repost it. And that'll be cocked. An 8, so a 9 is not enough to repost. But it wasn't a 1. Um, that is the end of that combat. Again, this is now just turning into a little slap fest. So, we will now go again. Uh, end phase. Nothing to check. The spell will come off. We now roll initiative. So, 10. 14 to 12 is a crit, but there's really nobody to put on delay. So, but the Kuzarks will have the first turn, or the initiative. So, magic phase. Yep, we got we to gotta keep trying to save our buddy here. So, we'll use the two. He will take an endurance test to see if he takes a life point. He passes it. So, he can try and cast and still have a full life. With a three, that will successfully go off. Once again, the other caster doesn't want to risk it. <coughs> the reason why the Kazar caster is risking it is because he has Die Hard. So if he were to fail that one, he'd get a second one to try and absorb the, the wound. Um, that caster is not going, to get, not going to try and stop it, and the other caster doesn't want to get hit for free. Um, so now we go to the movement phase. Really, nothing to move. All my guys are locked in that's going to move. The... Uh, yeah, so we'll go straight to shooting. Again, he needs to roll a 6 to hit the Cryomancer. He rolled a 2. So. We now go straight to combat. With the Kazarks winning, they will go ahead and do the Quarreler 1 first, on the off chance that the Quarreler might do something this time and not die. So a 5 will hit the Quarreler. His defense is 4. But his armor is five. So that four won't hurt him. Again, long sword just bounces off. So he's going to try and swing back. A two. So the parry. Nine. He should probably do his shield bass next turn just to try and finish this guy off. I have to remember that. Next up is the Forge Warden. He has to, once again, swing at the fist. A six. That will hit. Yay, he hits. So his Warhammer, because he's a big, bad, strong guy, is a D8, because that's what the Warhammer does, but his high strength gives him a plus one. The armor value of the fist is just like the Forge Warden. He has six. The Forge Warden just has to roll a five, though, on the D8, because he gets the plus one. So he rolls a seven, plus one is an eight. That's a wound. So now the fist does his attack back. A three will miss. The spearman will do his attack. A one, he really misses. Now this means they each have to take a test because they failed the combat. They lost the combat. Now they do get to use his leadership, so they're going to get a d12. They only need to roll a four. So starting with the fist, we'll see if the fist sticks around. Nope, the fist is going to run. He ran a one. He rolled a one. Now we're going to see if the spearman runs. Nope, the spearman sticks. So what this means is that the the fist gets away clean. Um, he doesn't have to worry about anybody chasing him down because the forge warden is still locked. But now he is panicked. And what panic does is you move a a random not a random amount a variant amount. So, you, you failed, you're going to panic. It is your movement plus d4 unless you have uh, the fast rule. 
If you have the fast rule, then it is movement plus d6. So um, this is considered a, uh, a direct panic move. There's two types of panic moves. Um, I wanted to look this up, so I told it to you guys the correct way. Um, there's direct and indirect. Direct is when um, caused by a single model, um, the direction of the movement um, must maximize the panic's model's distance from the enemy model that caused the panic. And you'll take the path of least resistance. Uh, this is lost combat. Somebody's that's terrifying tried to charge you, etc. So moving directly away, which directly away is there. There's a, a nice diagram in the book, but it's pretty much you bisect the middle of the base and you go that far away. So he's going to go this way and kind of angle out and around this uh, water feature. He's going to go his movement, which is five plus three. So he's going to go eight inches. So he is now panicking out this way. And he still has that damage. The spearman's holding tight, though. He's like, I got this, don't worry. So at the start of the turn, when he, they try to activate the, the fist, he's going to have to try and rally. Now he's only going to be on his own leadership because he's more than six inches away from his leader. So end phase, check victory conditions. Nope, nobody's won yet. So now we go back up to the top of the phase. We roll initiative. We'll see who gets the first turn. Or the initiative, this one. Seven to nine, so it's still the Kazarics. With only one power left, he is going to go ahead and attempt to do... Hmm, yeah, nope, nothing. Nothing, no casting. Um, at all, at all. So he's going to, he can't cast because he's panicked. So now we have movement. Ooh. As I kick my stand here, that'll wake me up. We're going to have him run four inches, turn and go another four inches and stop right here so he cannot be shot. All right. And the other guys are engaged, so they don't get to do anything. We're gonna attempt to rally this guy. So his discipline is a D8. He's got to roll a four. A one, he's gonna to continue to panic. So what this means now, So since he failed a rally test, now this is considered an indirect panic move. So he's going to try and get back to his home board, which is over here, and he has to avoid this while trying maximum and staying as far as away from those guys. So again, it's still the randomized speed plus D4. So it's speed plus two, so it's going to be seven. He's going to go around this train. So he's going to get right to more or less here. He is still panicked. The archer doesn't really want to shoot into combat. You can shoot into combat, um, but you're at a minus four to hit, um, and he wasn't hitting without the minus four. And then if you miss, you have a chance of hitting your own guy or another model that's engaged with the model you shot at. And so, you know, he's just going to go ahead, and he's going to get his seven movement to get him down onto the ground floor, and he might have to come out here and help. Especially since the High Quester can't seemingly kill the Coraler. Alright, so there's no shooting um, at all. We go straight to the fighting phase. The Kazarks went first, or won. So we're going to go ahead and have the Coraler do his thing first because, again, maybe he'll get lucky. Or the, the what will more likely happen is the High Quester will finally finish him off. So a 4 will hit him because that is what his defense is. His defense is 4. And the high quester gets a plus one. I uh, again forgot to say he was going to shield bash, so he does not get to shield bash since you have to say you're going to do it in order you to use it. A d8 damage. Three damage is not enough to get past that armor of five. And he is no longer buffed. Take that off. 
All right, so going then to the Quarreler, attempting to hit him with his D4. A two. All right, so he's going to try and parry. Maybe he can repost it this time. No, he doesn't. That's still a miss. So here, can he finish? Can he hit the Spearman? The Spearman's defense five, though. He's harder to hit than the Fist because he's got a shield. A four will not do it. His D6 back. A five will. So he gets hit. He has a D8 damage with the spear. Oh, he would have attacked first anyways because he had the standoff weapon. But he doesn't. <clears throat> he didn't get through the armor. So it has not mattered yet. He hasn't hit him yet. So Again, now he has kind of turned into a slap fest again for whatever reason. So um, this goes on and on. Um, I'm going to kind of wrap this game up here now again. Not going to conclusion, just wanted to show you the turn sequence. Um, you guys got to see panicking, you got to see crits. You didn't really get to see any cool tarches, but, you know, that's okay. Um, where this game really shines is in the campaign or the league settings where all your guys can get better. Um, that's one of the things that drew me to this game is the fact that my followers can get better. They get, as they go through experience, if they survive, they will get better. Your, your heroes, your leader... They'll get, you know, sometimes they get useless skills. Sometimes they get really cool ones, too. So, it's a fun game. I really love it. Low model ca um, count, so you don't have to paint 100 guys. Again, most starter boxes are six. There's one of them that has seven. Um, it is. It's just really fun. You should be seeing more videos of these from me um, and some of the other guys I play with because, again, we want to support the community. There's not a lot of movies out or videos out there on this game, and... You know, it's a great game. It's a great company. Check them out, DGS Games. Um, on their website, you can download PDFs of this stuff. It's all their model stat cards. You can get all the rules for all their models are for free. Um, now, things like the ice tokens and stealth tokens, those you'll need the rule books and the companion for. Um, but you can get the base guys. You can look and see, oh, this is what it does. It says right on there what indirect fire is it says right on there what dodge is what elude does all that stuff they want you to play their game they want you guys to tell them hey what do you think we need to change they are very open to listening uh, i hope you guys enjoyed the film i actually enjoyed making it uh, again they'll probably be seeing more of these so until next time